Hi, I'm Dr. Jennifer Gaudiani. I'm in my sweats because COVID, but my team and I thought that it would be really fun for me to read a little passage from my book, Sick Enough, each couple of days and share it with you. So I would like to invite you to take this time to make a cup of tea, maybe have a snack, and sit and join me for a cozy read along. I'm gonna be reading from each of the boxes at the ends of my chapters. So this passage is called The Perfect Child, perfect being in quotation marks, and it's found at the end of the chapter 30,000 foot view caloric restriction. I frequently hear the question, how did this eating disorder happen? Of course, this is a really complicated question because eating disorders are immensely complex and require a multidisciplinary team to bring clarity to any individual's illness. Ultimately, the information that is currently available to us indicates that eating disorders likely emerge from a combination of inherited, genetic, temperamental traits, and environmental and sociological factors. A diet, or accidental weight loss often provides the quote unquote spark in the dry grass. Everyone's story about how their disorder developed is unique. I'm intensely interested in the ways that apparent medical problems actually originated from emotional distress and contributed to the development of an eating disorder. Over many years of listening to my patients' stories through this lens, I've developed a narrative that helps describe how such a situation can occur. Sometimes I use this story with my patients to validate their past experiences, especially the ways in which the medical system failed to meet their needs. I'll tell the stories if I'm reading a storybook aloud, and in this case, I'll use female pronouns. There once was a little girl who from an early age was smart, intuitive, and sensitive. She could walk into a room and sense immediately how others were feeling. She also had a stronger than average reaction to external validation. That is, if someone praised her, she glowed. If someone criticized her even a little bit, she closed down like a sea anemone. This little girl might have grown up in an easygoing family, or she might have had a parent with substance use disorder, an anger management problem, or anxiety. There might have been a sibling who was a wild child or ill who took up a lot of the family's attention. Sometimes if the girl herself had a problem like a stomach ache, a well-meaning parent might try to reassure her by saying, you're fine. Maybe the parent looked up from their phone at that moment and those words just emerged. Maybe the parent had a hard time tolerating their child's distress and this reaction soothed the parent. Maybe the parent, a little fatigued from their super sensitive kid's reaction to the world, wanted to help her develop a tougher skin. Whether or not it was ever explicitly spoken, this little girl inferred that it was preferable for her to be fine. So she did her best. She was smart and a pleaser. She put a smile on her face and was sunny as often as possible, or at least quiet, and she was organized, driven, mature, and never a problem. Coaches, teachers, and her family called her the perfect child, words that made her glow. However, she was still super sensitive. She absorbed the world through her remarkable emotional radars, as numerous as the eyes of the Greek goddess Hera's multi-eyed guard, Argus. And whether it was a classroom discussion about global warming or her awareness of arguments and conflicts in her family or with her friends, she was absorbing everything and feeling extra worried, anxious, and burdened. She didn't seek a way to put words to these emotions because she was supposed to be fine. But a sensitive soul can only absorb so much without any way of processing it. The little girl continued to grow and she became more rigid in her routines, anxious around change, demanding of herself and perfectionistic. Around middle school, hormones started to flow, her body started to change, which she didn't particularly welcome, and social dynamics became more complicated. Her sensitive self couldn't take this whirlwind of input without a way to identify, organize, and soothe her responses to it. So her stomach started to hurt. That emotional overflow appeared physically in her body, in particular during stressful times on test days, when she'd have a fight with her friend, or any time that her worry level exceeded her ability to self-soothe. 
recurrent stomach aches got attention because the perfect child now had something medically wrong with her. Her parents took her to the pediatrician who examined her, maybe drew some blood, even sent her to a GI doctor, and of course, you know what they told her. You're fine. This really stung. She'd had a sense her whole life that maybe she wasn't actually fine emotionally, but she had managed as best she could. Now she had actual pain, something wrong physically, and she was once again told she's fine. So frustrating and invalidating. The parents saw this, and as the symptoms persisted and maybe even escalated, they took her to a dietitian to see if the symptoms might be due to food intolerances. The well-meaning dietitian said, well, let's try an elimination diet. Please avoid gluten, soy, sugar, and dairy. Uh, this would never happen with a dietitian who had expertise in eating disorders. And what did our rule follower do? She followed that advice precisely. Because she was doing something for herself, some part of her interpreted this dietary change as self-care. For a period of time, her tummy aches went away. She thought, wow, I really do have intolerances to those foods. And anyway, I want to be healthy because there are so many bad foods out there. Ultimately, this restrictive a diet couldn't meet her energy needs. The girl lost some weight, and people in our weight-obsessed society said, you look great. This positive reinforcement sealed the deal. She vowed to never go back to those old foods. The rigidity with which she adhered to her new regimen caused even more weight loss. That made her cave person brain kick in to slow her metabolism and raise her anxiety. Her belly started to hurt again and now felt terribly full after just a few bites of food. She started running as stress relief from all the pent up tension. Unlike her peers, she actually felt less anxious when she was underfed and the starvation numbed her sensitivity, which was a relief. Her food rules became more demanding and she started actively fearing weight gain and believing that her body was unacceptably large. The obsessive focus on food and body size provided a welcome distraction from overwhelming life tasks. Her bewildered family repeatedly said, wait, you've lost too much weight, you have to eat, please. They watched their perfect child retreat, close off, snarl when challenged, and disconnect from the family. In a breathtakingly short time, the eating disorder voice had become more compelling than the voice of any loved one. I'll stop there for today. Thank you so much for joining me. Because I didn't actually get to read my own book on the audio version of Sick Enough, it's delightful to be able to share it with you now. As a reminder, take care of yourself during this hard time. Do not hole up with your eating disorder. Keep working on recovery. See you next time.